I'm uh, going to talk to you today about just how the contractors uh, work with the EDD, planning for to meet the EDD requirements, um, and in essence, it sort of goes along with this graphic that's on the on the screen here, getting all that stuff in the field into that into the little computer, in one way or another. Um, things I'm going to touch on today, I'm going to give a very high-level overview. <coughs> of the actual EDDs, just so to set you up so you, you understand uh, some of the terms we'll be using. Uh, go over some stages in planning and executing a project to help meet that requirement. Some of the challenge con challenges contractors uh, encounter while working with the EDD and creating the EDDs. And then a little bit about uh, some hints in working with, uh, for us, laboratories and subcontractors uh, to help you out. Um, in general, there are, there are a few guidance documents. The primary guidance documents are the Comprehensive Specifications Manual. Um, these are uh, versions 2, versions 3 will be out any, any day now, no, uh, sometime next week. Um, the Comprehensive Manual, <coughs> excuse me, pretty much lays out all the requirements of the electronic files uh, in great detail. Uh, the other reference document is the Valid Values Reference Manual. This uh, uh, gives a list of all the valid values that you would need to uh, populate your EDDs with to be able to load them up into the system. Uh, there's also um, some other information on the site. There's a basic uh, manual for uh, creating and submitting an EDD that has a lower uh, level of requirements for historical data, as well as um, electronic files for uh, creating the EDD, electronic templates and things of that nature. General submittals for the EDD is there's the initial submittal, and there's a field submittal, a vapor intrusion submittal, and a chemistry submittal that goes uh, with the EDD. Uh, it's also for note that there is the basic submittals, set of submittals that allow you to use, uh, it's a lower, um, less rigorous form of the EDD, I guess, collects a little less information, but it's useful for historical data. This is <clears throat> goes a little bit into the details of the electronic data deliverable. Um, each of the data sets is made up of several individual files. Uh, the files contain all the relevant data uh, to that data set. Things such as uh, sample locations, um, sub-facility IDs, well construction information, water tables are in the field of uh, EDD set, uh, vapor intrusion, some of your building information. Uh, chemistry, of course, you know, samples, test results, uh, and then the basic has a, a basic form of pretty much each one of those, basic location, basic chemistry, geology. One thing you really need to uh, understand <coughs> is that the database is set up so that a facility is equivalent to an EPA site. So every site has to have a unique set of operable units. You can have operable units uh, one through uh, whatever, um, but they have to be unique for that facility. So you have to have one, two, three. You can't have two operable units, one within one facility. Now, same thing with locations. Locations have to be unique back to the facility. So if you have two operable units, each operable unit cannot have the same monitoring well number. You can't have monitoring well number one in operable unit one and a monitoring well number one in operable unit two. So the, the locations have to be unique back to the facility. Samples, <coughs> also in the same vein, each sample has to be a unique identifier back to the facility. So if you're doing multiple rounds, you can't have samples called MW01 uh, for the first round and call it MW01 for the second round. You have to call it like MW01, MW01-R1, year one, quarter one, however you have to do it, just so you have a unique identifier all the way back to the facility level. Now a little bit about just collecting data to meet the EDD and how to work it in. Um, this is a, a pretty basic view of the planning we all do when we go uh, to work with a site. Uh, your planning documents always talk about your field investigations, your laboratory analysis, you know, validation requirements, what sort of work you're going to do in post-investigation. Generally what this also lays out is that 
from the field, your samples tend to fly off in two different directions, and, or your information goes in two different directions. Hopefully, your samples only go in one. Uh, the field notes, from the field, you take the field notes, the log books, you go into a post-field uh, investiga investigation type work where you start consolidating that information, uh, do your geoanalysis on that data you get. Uh, there, from the geoanalysis, you would create an EDD that feeds into the database, uh, you know, your own database. From the field investigations, you have the chain of custodies which come off, which give you a lot of your sample information, meets up in the laboratory with the laboratory analysis, laboratory presents you with data packages on EDDs. You guys work with uh, the CLP data a lot. They're set up to create a CLP EDD that's, that fits this model. And then if you have subcontractor work, you have to do an extra validation step and get that into an EDD to go into the database. Uh, once the database is populated, then you can do your analysis. Uh, this is kind of from the contractor's perspective, so we also have, as part of the output, the Region 2 EDD. Where some of the data comes from that actually populates uh, all those files we saw, it's like site background information. We always have a certain level of information from the site, site name. You might be able to get some historical data at that point, which I'll talk about a little bit later. That has to be dealt with a certain way unless it's sort of a transplant direct out of your systems, then that data can just be dealt with right away. It can export out of your systems uh, to your subcontractors, or to your contractors rather, and they should be able to bring their data systems right up into it. Uh, from basic planning, I know we all generally start with a GIS these days. Uh, when we start putting plant project plans together, we start with a base map. From there, you get your location data. You can get your coordinates directly off of that. The DXF is part of our submittal. Uh, so we can export a DXF out to your GIS folks and they can pull that data in. You also wind up with well borings, your boring locations. You set up your location identification uh, scheme, your sample identification scheme, and your analytical requirements. So if you plan all these out, you won't want run into that problem of you know, having multiple IDs that are the same within a facility. Uh, data from field work, I tested on this a little bit, but you get your sample information, your date, times, depths, uh, some sam physical sample parameters, uh, color, smell, if you happen to have any. Um, well construction and boring data is also gathered in the field that you can bring forward. Uh, water level information from field logs and even field measurements and purge data can all be collected within the, these e the Region 2 EDD set. Post investigation, uh, you can actually <coughs> utilize, to some extent, the EDD to, to start filling out some of your post-investigation work, because you always have to enter something in. At some point, somebody has to sit at a computer and enter the information in uh, for sample IDs and locations and things like that, or they have to pick them off a chart. Um, so once it get, you start building that into the EDD, um, from there, if you capture your sample information, your dates, your times, you can export that out to create a trip report. So you only, you know, the field folks only have to enter it once, and from there they can create several reports from starting to build that EDD template. And we use the templates to load into our data systems as well. So it, it kind of fits in with the, the flow of work. Uh, geology software, <coughs> you know, a lot of folks are using the geology software. Uh, Rockworks, Gint are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. When we create those, generally we create those with the EDDs in mind to try to meet the Region 2 uh, formats as we start working with the data after we come in out of the field. Recording field measurements, the EDDs are set up to capture a lot of field rip measurement information. That can be recorded coming in from the field. So instead of having your um, field staff enter stuff into just a spreadsheet, they can actually enter it into the EDD. And from there, you can start working with it, exporting it how you need it. Because the EDD templates that are up on the website are basically Excel format, so they're fairly easy to work with. Um, additional field work that you run into is going out after the wells are in, you send the surveyor out for the, fun, you know, kind of get the final um, X, Y coordinates, heights, depths, um, elevations for the final well construction. You know, all this data needs to get back uh, to marry up with the rest of the electronic data. Uh, your surveyors can, can help you do that if you work with them, as a, and I'll speak to that a little bit later with subcontracting. Uh, subsequent rounds of sampling, again, I'll harp on it a little bit, but they need to be unique sample ID, IDs when you go out for additional quarters or rounds of sampling. 
And then you go out and you'll probably be taking water levels. Water levels are unique pretty much by their date and the well they're collected at. Uh, data from analytical laboratories, uh, we're all pretty familiar with this. Uh, the analytical information, the labs delivered back to us, the methods, uh, the results, QA, QC, batch QC, all that data has a place in the electronic data deliverable. And most labs can actually provide this to you. And as I said, the CLP labs uh, give us what they call a superset file uh, that EarthSoft has created a, a, a Oh, what's your soft tool called for the CLP? Uh, the conversion. The CLP conversion tool. Sorry, I can think of that right off the bat. That's why Janet Cheers is a little signs every once in a while. Um, post analysis, you may wind up, if you're doing subcontract labs, you're going to have to do some amount of data validation in the post analysis. And that's something that also needs to be handled very specifically within the EDD. And I'll talk more to that point a little bit later on. This, I'm going to let this sink in for just a minute. Um, there'll, be a quiz. there'll be a quiz later, yes. <coughs> um, this is a, is a rather detailed flow chart of the sample and data management flow process. It is a lot. It breaks all the rules of presentation because there's more up here than I can talk about with probably, you know, a day and a half or something like that. But what it I put it here for a couple of reasons, aside from just dramatic effect. Um, there is, you can see within these, within each one of these uh, larger cells where we have uh, like project and sample planning, field work, field investigation, all those things go back to my bubble diagram, uh, sample validation going off to the lab. But all of that process on the left has to feed into your data management systems that are way over there to the right before you can actually uh, come out with reporting and, and things of that nature. And this is kind of, you know, just all this stuff has to come together in a, in a nice, friendly format, a nice, friendly way, so that the EDD uh, merges with your data systems without any problem. Which kind of, you know, bringing the pieces together, you, 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 know, you sort of had the zipper effect with the, uh, the merge lanes. Um, information from multiple sources. Sometimes we have multiple laboratories. Uh, we send stuff to CLP. It goes to DESA labs, comes in from subcontractor labs. So if everything flows nicely, traffic keeps moving, there are no problems. But I look at it as what it takes for me to get out of the house in the morning when I throw on my coat and I pull up my zipper, if, well, except for daylight today. Uh, say it's winter. I throw on my coat, I, I zip up, and, I, and I'm out the door a few seconds. I do it several days in a row, zip up the coat out the door in a few seconds. One day I throw in the coat, zipper gets stuck. You know, I might fiddle around with it for five minutes or something. Otherwise, I abandon that coat, put on another one, go out the door. But when I come back, that coat's still sitting there waiting for me to fix. And if it happens to be my favorite coat, just like the data that always goes missing is everybody's favorite data, you know, you're going to have to deal with it. So it's just one of the realities. Not everything meshes together in perfect sequence. And you can take this a little bit further to think about in the EDD world, when you're getting all this information, trying to get a, a bunch of children out the door at the same time, and they're putting on their coats and zipping them up. The um, preparation and some challenges while capturing, capturing this EDD. There's always, whenever you're bringing a lot of information together, there's always going to be some challenges that arise. One of the challenges is working with the various uh, softwares that are out there. Um, ESRI and AutoCAD, we all have used, been using them for a long time. The information that comes out of those is not necessarily directly compatible. And what I mean by directly compatible is I can hit a button and somehow it magically turns into my EDD and I can just be on my way. You do, it does gather all the information. It's great places to organize the data. Uh, exports can be made into a usable format. So you export out of your GIS into a format that you can uh, <coughs> join right up with the location information from the e, uh, for the EDD and then load it up. So. I mean, they're very good tools. Rockworks, GINT, the same thing. Again, not directly compatible with GINT. Once you set up uh, all your um, boring logs and do your fence diagrams, things of that nature, you can create um, correspondence files uh, for GINT to get the data out. And Rockworks have, has similar uh, processes to be able to get data out of it into a format that you can use for creating the EDD and loading it up. The other things are, are the... Um, 
Uh, two items that were, were used for collecting field information. One is forms to light, which we have been using in the past. Um, it's not that directly compatible. The export was in an XML file and it was a little, it had a lot to work with. It was created to put together um, uh, labels and change the custodies and it's very good at that. But when you export it out, it, it takes a lot to finagle it into a, a decent EDD. Scribe, again, is not directly compatible and you know, I know there are scribe lovers out there, uh, but it's not a, like a one button deal. You still have to look at the scribe data. You have to figure out where the individual pieces go, create an export to export it out into a, a format that you can use to create the EDD. Um, all these data sets are all used to, to organize information. Once you get the information in there, you can export it out. This is another one of those charts. Um, this one is just a little bit, this is what we set up for just for our fields field crews to be able to come in and we say you have to do these things with the information you get out of the field. One is um, working with this field sample information, the forms to light data this was set up for. We haven't done one for Scribe yet. Um, but they basically have to get the data into forms to light, they export it out. They, it's important that they confirm that with what happened with the actual chain of custodies. If, uh, God forbid, a sample was sent off, a bottle broke and we're not expecting results back for that, if that's not captured it, right after the field work by the field crews, you know, when it comes back to getting the data a month or so later, sometimes two months later, and you're loading it into the data set, and you see that, you know, geez, there's, there's no semi-volatiles for this, for this sample. I know we took them. I had the project manager calling me saying, where are the semi-volatile semi -volatile results? I'm looking around for them. I finally find out that there are none because the bottle broke. So if that information isn't transferred uh, into your like your data completeness set and it gets down to your data set to load into Excel to load into that EDD then you're looking for ghosts and it's always very hard to find ghosts and it always takes a lot of time. Uh, certain analytical data uh, can also present some challenges. Uh, green size uh, and some geophysical data. Uh, a lot of the geophysical laboratories aren't necessarily set up to routinely create an EDD. Um, and, you know, sometimes the valid values are unique to that geophysical laboratory. So you need to work with the geophysical labs a little bit closer uh, to have them um, become familiar with and be able to report out in the Region 2 format. Uh, grain size is, is, is one I run into that's particularly um, not troubling, but takes a little bit more effort. And mostly, I, I imagine it's probably because it's more of a physical measurement where they're, you know, writing down times, getting the grain size, the sieve sizes, and writing things down and recording them sort of in an Excel uh, table or something of that nature. And plus your descriptions for your grain size, um, your sieve sizes are very unique. And if they don't put the dashes in the right place or the spaces, in, it just, the valid EDDs just don't match. So it's something that they, you know, you need to get that information to your uh, geophysical laboratories. Uh, dioxin and PCB congeners are another couple of analyses that uh, create some unique reporting requirements. Uh, one thing that's unique about dioxins is there's something called the estimated maximum possible concentration, the EMPC. Uh, this value, this is a qualifier that's added by um, your data validators, so it's not something that comes in from the laboratory, and it doesn't necessarily fit the model for the interpreted qualifier um, as as the um, EPA Region 2 EDD is currently set up. The, the interpreted qualifier requires two uh, characters. The MPC kind of doesn't meet that, but it's very important information for people who work with dioxins. So the data is reported. It's captured in the electronic data deliverable. Um, you can put that information in a remark field, a uh, result remark field, and it can be available to you. But the reason I bring that out is that you need, if you're working with dioxins, you need to be aware of it, that you may have to, some unique reporting requirements. PCB congeners, uh, similarly, there's a thing that happens with PCB congeners called a co peak, and that's basically where two, three, or four congeners actually co so you only get one result representing three congeners. Uh, this presents a problem because the laboratory, when they report that information to you, they identify those congeners in the coelution by the lowest that number coelution, coeluting congener. Uh, and that is, they'll, they'll call each one like a C61, 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 
as far as that's the congener number 61 that those three peaks uh, co-elute with. The reason I bring this up is that if the lab gets a hit for, for, one of, for that co-elution, they may report out like 500 ppb for each one of those congeners even though the sum of those congeners is what is 500 ppb. So if you don't understand that, if you're not looking for that and the lab doesn't label things exactly correctly, you can wind up, if you do a total congener count of your, your data system, you can wind up counting that 500 three times, coming up with 1,500 1, ppb instead of just 500 for those three congeners. So it's items like that, you know, they're, they're working on, on uh, business rules and things to, to uh, address that, but you know, that'll take, it'll take some time. So if you work with dioxins and you work with PCB congeners, you know, it's something to be, to be aware of. And the data is gonna be in the data system. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about where it shows up. And you, know, you, you just need to make sure you understand how to pull that information out if it's specific to you. Uh, dioxin and PCBs also have an expanded list of surrogates. Um, they have carbon-13 surrogates for just about every compound there is. Uh, so that sometimes those might may not make it into the system. We'll have to get more valid values, but they're starting to address that. That's where your, you know, your contractors may call up and say, there's no cast numbers for this. Um, an additional is radiological data can sometimes, it's not as much of a challenge, but it's different enough where you, know, you need to be aware of it. Um, radiological laboratories are generally set up to meet DOE requirements. Um, there's additional information that they're required to report, like counting error and background, that need to be captured. Uh, the Region 2 EDD has places to capture this data, uh, but again, it, it might not be set up in the standard reporting, so if you work with radiological data and you need that information, you might have to you know, work to create some unique reports to get that data out. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with RAD data, uh, it would be good to sort of walk through the EDD with your radiological laboratory so you understand where, where the data is and what it's, uh, where its place is in the EPA Region 2 um, EDD. As promised, a little bit about validation and review. Um, a very important concept within the electronic data deliverable and within the database system is that the idea of, um, excuse me, reportable result. For reanalysis and dilutions, usually you only have, you only want one result to come out for any one compound. So if there's reanalysis, some of those have to be flagged as not reportable. An example is uh, you run a sample and TCE exceeds the criteria, you want to run a dilution. The initial run should have a reportable result flag yes for everything but TCE. The diluter run should have a reportable flag no for everything except TCE. So that way you only get one result out when you go to run your systems. Otherwise, if you do a report and that result flag is not set properly, you get uh, duplicate results for each sample. And you'll wonder why, and that's probably the reason. Another thing is where dual columns are, are used for like uh, GC analysis, uh, pesticides, PCBs occasionally. Uh, run off dual columns, and one of those columns have to be set as reportable yes or no. Your validation laboratory, um, <coughs> excuse me, the EDD has three fields of qualifiers, one from the laboratory, one from validation, and what they call an interpreted qualifier. The interpreted qualifier is generally what's reported out with most of the canned reports and the reports that are probably being produced. Um, the validator adds, you know, the laboratory provides their qualifier, the validator will add their qualifier to that in the validation field, and then you would have the interpreted qualifier, which would be um, the validator's summation or replacement qualifier. One example is if the lab reports a non-detect, the validator thinks, well, it's not a really good number, they put a J on it, you wind up with a UJ as your, you know, interpreted qualifier. Uh, there's also um, fields in the data set to um, identify whether data has been validated or not. So, you know, the validation flag, yes, no. So that way when you bring data sets out, you'll know whether it's been validated and you'll know to what level. There's fields in there to capture the level of validation as well. Your validator might need to set uh, some flags as reportable, yes or no, or, or detect, yes, no. Uh, the detect is if there, if a, 
value is not detected less than the detection limit. They set, set it to a U. Um, if you get a small hit and there's a blank contamination associated with that, the validator might say that hit's not relevant. They'll set it as detect no. That way the reporting limit gets, gets reported out. If during validation there was, say, a positive hit around 10, people want to take control of my machine. Um, there's a positive hit around 10. I better not mess up anymore. They'll probably <laughs> really do it. <laughs> Sorry, getting distracted. Um, if, they, if your uh, lab reports, like say, uh, I don't know, a result around 10 ppb, you had a blank contamination that's at nine, the validator will probably report that as non-detect, put a U in, but they'll want that 10 to be reported. So they may need to update the um, reporting limit with that 10 as well. So that when you report out of your systems, and it sees that it's a non de uh, not detected, it'll report out that higher value um, for the detection limit. Uh, historical data. Um, the phrase that brings fear into my heart is we have it electronically whenever anybody talks about historical data. Because uh, it, can, it can mean anything. And, you know, I've had people turn over historical data to me electronically and it was nothing but the fifth generation copy PDF. Um, and, and it's as good as having hard copy. There's not much you can do with it electronically. Um, so basically historic data, you need to know, review the data in detail to see how, how it fits, how it fits with your new plans, how you can bring that data forward. Um, the data, historical data may be a significant effort just to get it to meet the basic deliverable so you can load it into the systems. So you really have to take the time to look at it to figure out what it's going to take to get it in there. And then a practical matter is, is it worth bringing forward? Do you only need to bring part of it forward? So, you know, those are all, you know, your management decisions that I really don't have to worry about. I just have to follow what you tell me to do. Uh, the other thing with historical data is you need to really consider how it fits with your new data set, the sample information, the sample IDs, the location IDs. You know, uh, will it fit the way it is? Do you have to modify? If you have a lot of historical data and you don't want to change it, you might have to modify you know, how you name your wells, how you name your locations. Or you may have to go back and rename some of the historical data, just so it, it fits and it makes sense for the site going forward. Um, and you may need to, you probably will need to apply some new valid values, update the valid values in the historical data to meet the Region 2 um, valid value requirements. A little bit about um, working with subcontractors. Uh, one thing I've learned through my many long years is that uh, if when I work with contractor, other contractors and subcontractors, if I'm not thinking about the EDD, what needs to be done with it, they're certainly not going to be thinking about it uh, because if it's not on their radar, as all of you know and, and you probably say about us contractors as well, if it's not on their radar, it's not part of the plan, you know, it's not something we're, we're thinking about. So it's just important to like keep it in mind. And I guess what it, the grand thing is to start taking away is like the EDD is, is a deliverable that we have to meet. Uh, it's in all our contracts now. And if we're not planning on it, it, it makes it that much harder to meet it. Uh, so contract laboratories just ensure, you know, that they're familiar with the, the region two requirements. Uh, have them check their valid values that come out of their systems, how they name their methods, how they name their samples. Um, how they name spikes and duplicates, just so when, you know, when it comes back to you, you don't have to change all those things to get it to upload into the Region 2 uh, format. Uh, pay particular attention if you're asking for, um, I call them odd compounds, odd compounds, but oddly named compounds, compounds that probably don't have a CAS registry number to them. Uh, nitrate nitrite is, is a classic example. Uh, a lot of folks put NO2 slash NO3 think that was right. Um, but in the valid value list, it doesn't have the slash. It just has NO2, NO3 straight across. So it seems like a simple thing, but when you go to load the data, it gets rejected and you have to change them all. So if you have six samples, not a big deal. If you have 1,006 samples, it starts to become a pretty big deal. Uh, total organic carbon, any of the, the totals up that you do, total pHs, things like that, they have very specific names. Uh, and and the so on is something I didn't actually mention this morning, so it's a good thing this one's being recorded, is uh, tick analysis. There's very specific namings for ticks. Uh, I, they're trying to discourage concatenating the, the unknown one with a time. Uh, so 
you know, there you would have your valid values. If you let an unknown with a timestamp on it go into the system, you'll have your valid values will just probably clog up your system after a while with all the ticks that would be coming in. So the ticks are there's specific naming schemes, particularly for uh, groups of ticks, uh, whether they're you know alkylated PAHs or something like that. <laughs> Um, whatever the ticks are, some ticks are actually identified, and if it's an identified identified tick and it has a an applicable cast number, we may you may it may actually be very germane to your site, and you may have to you know go back and analyze for that some more. So you may have a request. You can put in a request to have valid values added to the list, and that pretty much there is a valid value request on that uh, website where you can print it out request a new valid value, submit it, and, and get a response for adding a valid value. Surveyors and working with surveyors. Um, it's very important that your surveyors even understand the Region 2 requirements and know the valid values that they're supposed to report back to you. Because we get, they're collecting a lot of information from the surveyors. Um, it's good if we can export the location and well IDs to the surveyors, maybe put them in a uh, somewhat pre-populated location and well EDD. That way the surveyors can take that, go out in the field, do their work, repopulate repop that EDD for us and turn it back over to us without having to worry about them typing in the name over again and leaving out those those pesky dashes and spaces and zeros. Um, if you export it out of your system, you give it to them and they give it back to you, it'll make it that much easier. If you can't, you know, if the surveyors, you know, can't pre-populate the EDD, at least, you know, provide them with the location information and make sure they provide you back the level of detail that you require to meet the EDD. O&M subcontractors, uh, again, ensuring that they're familiar with the Region 2 requirements as well. Uh, they may need to work directly with the laboratory. We have uh, some subcontracts out with O&M uh, now where they gather the information, they submit the samples to the laboratories, they get the EDD back, and they're actually turning the EDD into, into EPA Region 2 as well as us, so that we're not just being a pass-through for anything. Um, so they need to become very familiar uh, with the Region 2 electronic deliverable, and if also during O&M you find that you need to, excuse me, add extraction or injection wells, there is specific information that needs to be gathered for those extraction and injection wells. Uh, and if the o &M contractor is the one taking the lead on that, you know, they have to be able to provide that information in the EDD format. You don't want to, after the o is complete, to go back and try to get that information. It's best to try to get all information up front, as always. Three is thinking about it, is, is adopting this format as well, as well as uh, New York State DEC has adopted uh, this, this format. So that they can share data back and forth, and it's it's actually um, great <laughs> because you know we work with Region Three and DC also, and we have had instances where we received information from EPA for for a new site to us that came directly out of the, the data systems. We were able to receive it as an EDD export from EPA Region Two, and since we have compatible system, we were able to load it directly up into our systems, but. Even, even with uh, contractors that might not have an exactly compatible system, at least the whole format is defined so that if data has to be transferred, at least people know what they're getting. Um, I've had data sent to me, and I had no idea what was in there. The codes were just foreign to me. You know, they, whatever, they seemed like they were making stuff up, but, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't uh, something I was used to dealing with, and it took some time just to go through it. So if everything's defined, that's like, you know, takes you 95% to where you need to be. Uh, first, I'll address the question about bet uh, the differences between Region 2 and the Region 4 format. <coughs> there are uh, differences. The uh, format's basic structure is the same. The, uh, what Region 4 has done is they've customized it a little bit to add more project level and task level information into their format, uh, which requires some additional uh, fields in the format. Uh, there may be some additional changes to that, but the basic structure of the format for Region 2, Region 4, Region 5, 
and 3 are all the same. Did, does that answer the question for the folks online? If not, chat away back and we will we'll try to be a little bit more specific. Um, there is nothing that has a you know, side-by-side -side comparison of the two, but if you uh, open the Region 2 in the e and, and the Region 4 in the EDP checker, you will uh, see immediately that some of the um, differences are, again, those leading fields at the task level and project level, and those are at the beginning of the columns uh, for each section. Uh, region 4 was able to upload some data that they sent that was in the Region 2 format. So they are close enough that they're able to be compatible. A lot of the reference values are the same. Uh, the, the way they've set up the systems between the different regions is they're trying to be consistent with the, re the valid values, how they refer to matrix. Um, they're all using the same uh, analyte method lists. They're using uh, the same, uh, obviously, the CAS numbers and whatnot. But they've, worked, they've been working very hard to be consistent so that it is uh, easier for folks to make that deliverable. Region 3 format, the, if you need to request the Region 3 format, you can uh, request that on the Region 2 page. So that is uh, basically the same. And uh, the other regions, you would go to their web pages to re request their formats as well. The other thing I want to comment on is uh, the documentation for the Region 2 format. The folks here at Region 2 have done a great job at making resources available for folks to be able to uh, comply to this format. And if you go to that web page, which we keep talking about, and I don't have a slide here of it, but if you were on yesterday's call, it would be there. As uh, Nicole said, if you just search, you'll, you'll find it in Google. And what they've done is they've added documentation up there for the comprehensive and uh, the valid values, as Scott mentioned. But they also have links for if you need to submit a new uh, request, a new valid values. If you have an analyte that's not on the list, a method that's not on the list, you can go to the web page and da download the little form that you can do that. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, there's an email at the bottom of that page that you can submit questions. If you need to look at uh, any of the valid values, there's additional documents up there that you can download. There's also links to the download pages. There's just a whole wealth of information up there. So I highly recommend you, you go there and uh, check that out if you need any more information or to download uh, any additional uh, information on the format. One of the things that I did want to uh, address is the fact that the format is not a static format. And that's a good thing. The reason the format changes is because the contractors and the folks at Region 2 say, look, I need to do this, or I need to gather this type of data, or this isn't working for me, can we modify it this way? So <coughs> what they're doing is they're trying to respond to these comments and uh, uh, be proactive and get a, a format out there that can be used, and, and occasionally this, uh, it does get modified. <coughs> I'm going to lose my voice here. So what you need to do is go to that web page, the download web page, and make sure that you check the format dates on the, on the download page because there, um, there are new valid values that are posted there. But it will also give you uh, the latest format. The version 3 of this format for Region 2 uh, and Region 3, the version 3 does have some, uh, some additional sections, as is mentioned, the, the vapor intrusion section, which was added, and uh, the renaming of the sections to make it easier to read. And also, we grouped the, the sections of the format so it's easier to understand what's in your initial submittal, what's considered the chemistry submittal, where is, how do you submit your basic or your historical data. Okay, and again, you can read the name. It's not a cryptic you know, DRP, it says data provider. So it, it makes it a little bit easier to read and understand. The other thing that they have, uh, that's a, a new requirement with the version 3 format is that the site-specific action levels are being requested now. And <coughs> if you have site-specific action levels that you're reporting with your data, you need to uh, put that into a small EDD, and that can be included with your package that's being submitted 
with your initial submittal. So you would uh, add that information into a spreadsheet and in the EPA Region 2 uh, EDP there's a section for files which allows you to attach uh, a DXF, a map, uh, you can attach a log here, basically any log and when you package this data up and send it, it will package those files up and allow you to submit all those files along with your data.